I don't actually say I'm a psychologist because everybody thinks of you know the leather chair and therapy and they for years afterwards will make jokes about me psychoanalyzing them and even if I explain endlessly that I don't do that kind of psychology I do another kind of psychology they just don't get it so I tell them I'm a cognitive scientist they have no idea what this means but at least they don't have the wrong idea and it doesn't take me two years of training to sort of get them uh, back on track uh, so I'm hoping that after this uh, this series that you all will be at least somebody I can say yes I am proud I am a psychologist and you'll have some idea what that means uh, so psychology is an interesting field, and it's an interesting mix of different angles and approaches on essentially understanding uh, human minds and what uh, people are like. Uh, I don't know if everybody, anybody's heard the story of the blind men and the seven blind men and the elephant, where uh, the blind men have never seen, never, well, obviously never seen, but never, they'll know an elephant. Uh, don't know what one is like, and they hear one's coming to a village nearby. So they travel, they go to the elephant, and one of them, you know, grabs a leg and says, "Ah, now I know what an elephant is. It's like a tree." And another one grabs the uh, the the trunk and says, "Oh, I know what an elephant is. It's like a snake." And another one grabs a tusk and says, "Oh, I know what an elephant is. It's like a spear." And the, the sort of moral of that, I think they end up duking it out and the, and the trunk guy wins. But, um, <laughs> but the moral of the story is that in some sense they're all right and they're all wrong. They all have a chunk of the bigger picture. And psychology has many different perspectives, many different approaches, many different techniques, all trying to characterize the same elephant. And when you look at the entire picture of psychology, you can then, by using everybody's eyes or hands, uh, get an idea of what, uh, of what people are like. And so what I'll be presenting is, uh, is the tail part, which isn't in this picture. Um, so what do radiology, national security, language, and bird watching have in common? Anybody read the title of my, <laughs> my talk? Uh, they all involve categorization. In all of these areas, you're deciding what is what. And that turns out to be an incredibly useful thing to be able to do and influences virtually everything we do, uh, which is why it's the best part of psychology. <laughs> So let's look at radiology first real quick. Uh, so imagine, oh, that didn't come out nice. Um, imagine you've got x-ray film, and you have to figure out uh, what some little shadow looks like and what it is, whether it's a break or whether it's not a break. And so that's a categorization decision. Is this little shadow on the x-ray film an artifact, or is it an actual break? Is, what's my diagnosis? Um, and often you'll need to take several things and, and use information from a variety of different resources to come to a good conclusion. Here's another example. Uh, if you've traveled lately, uh, you have, your luggage goes through a scanner at the airport and uh, essentially they look through your bag and decide, is this bag a threat or not? Do I need to, you know, uh, you know, chunk this guy in the in the clinker, or do I or I let him on the plane? Right? What do I do? Uh, and this, uh, well, I'll let you decide. How many people would let this bag on the plane? Raise your hand if you would if you let it on the plane. <laughs> okay. Well, you shouldn't. Uh, there's a knife in the bag. Thank you very much. I hope that's not your day job. Um, <laughs> And the knife handle looks a little funny because uh, the, you know, the metal part shows up a little, a little more strongly. Another aspect, oh, mine looked good and then they switched it for theirs. Okay, so uh, another aspect of categorization is in language. In language, we're constantly categorizing the sounds that we hear. Oh, perfect. 
OK. Uh, the constantly categorizing the sounds that we hear as phonemes, which are the little sounds that are the building blocks of words. So by categorizing these sort of noisy speech signals into phonemes, you can classify them as particular words and sort of build your way up. So you make all these sounds with your lips and with your you know, tongue. Uh, and if you look at them, if you create a visual representation of them, you end up with things like this, right, which are spectrographs. Uh, and the interesting thing is that this is a very, 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 very difficult categorization problem that we do very easily and quickly uh, without any trouble. So if you take, this is the B, so B is a phony, and this is the B in bet, and the B in B, and the d in debt and the d in deal. But the problem is that the debt and the deal look a lot more like each other than the bet and the b do, right? These two look alike, and these two look different. And so you've got essentially the same phoneme that's I that, that looks more like a different phoneme than it does members of the same category. And so the categories, in some sense, are overlapping. And you have to use lots of different con uh, contextual information to sort these things out. So uh, you can't really get it very easily from a single sound. So you would think, OK, well, you use the information from the words around it. But if you look at the speech signal for a sentence, so this is a snippet of a sentence John said that the dog snapped at him. And it's not even clear where the words really are, right? So you've got big gaps here between s, s and n, and a, and smaller gaps between whole words. So even though on the page, you know, we nicely space all the words out and make it really easy for us to classify, in speech sounds, all of these things are incredibly messy. So uh, bird watching. Uh, experienced birders identify many hundreds of species of birds uh, from different angles, different distances, different lighting conditions based on their appearance and on their behavior. And one of the interesting things uh, about birds is that the information isn't uh, all over the place. Right? On a bird, there are certain places like the head that contain lots of different features that tell you what kind of bird it is. So becoming an expert birder is essentially becoming an expert in, in figuring out where the informative parts are and paying attention to those and not being distracted by the uninformative parts. So it's uh, what we call selective attention, being able to attend to the information that's relevant to the task and ignoring other kinds of information. And this is a very important feature of human categorization. So there's some tools that we use when we study uh, selective attention. Uh, one of the tools uh, that we use is an eye tracker, which is a device that looks like this uh, and unfortunately costs more than your car. Uh, in it are some high-speed cameras and some near-infrared diodes that essentially track where your pupils are looking and also track where your corneal reflection in is. And from that, can determine precisely on the screen or wherever that you're looking. Uh, and this allows us to know what features people are paying attention to. What, how that changes across expertise, how we may, might be able to help people learn how to identify things better to move their selective attention or to move their attention around more efficiently and effectively. Uh, so this is going to be a movie. This is a sort of artificial microorganism that we use in the lab. And what you'll see is a little blue dot that jumps around uh, the screen. And that shows exactly where the participant is looking at any one particular time. So it jumps around quite fast, much more uh, so than you would sort of consciously be led to believe. And as you can see, the participant is really looking at all the different features here and investigating what they look like and sort of jumping around quite a bit. This is indicative of sort of early learning where people are just getting a feel of what's what and they don't really know uh, what's going on. And so you can plot the sort of what they call a scan path. You can plot exactly where people look over time and see uh, what features they're investigating first uh, and potentially understand what hypotheses they have about how, uh, uh, how the features relate to the categories that they're trying to learn. 
this scan path is more indicative of somebody who's uh, gotten much better at the task. They don't jump around all over the place. They investigate the two features they think are important, ignore completely this one, which seems sort of attractive, but is nevertheless uh, sort of useless for making the categorization that they, they're doing. So that's one tool that we do to actually measure people's behavior. When you talk about behavior, you normally think of people behaving in the world. But actually, eye movements are very subtle and informative sorts of uh, behaviors. Another tool that we use is uh, mathematical modeling. In mathematical modeling, you create essentially a set of formulas that act like little categorizers. So if you think people shift their attention really fast, then you put that into an equ equation that sort of forces attention to be shifting very fast. If you think people remember just the gist of what they see, then you can uh, put that into a mathematical equation and then give the, the model essentially the task that you give people, and it will produce uh, data just the way people do. So for instance, we use uh, somewhat complicated models. So uh, I always joke that psychology uh, has long been the science for people who don't like math. Uh, but it is not really that science anymore, so make sure you take your math classes. Um, but essentially, you have a model, and then you uh, try and produce the data that the people produce. So this is uh, a bunch of human data up here. These numbers are essentially which features of a stimulus the participant was using to make their decision, so the color or the diameter, or the angle, or, or combinations of. And so this is all, these are all human participants who fall into these categories. These two are actually mathematical models. So we've given the, the same experiment to the model, and, and it produces uh, essentially human data, and then we can see uh, how closely our assumptions about how the information's combined and how attention moves about fits with the human data. Uh, except this is, you know, uh, a few hundred people, and the, this is 52,000 simulated participants. So you can do quite a bit of simulation sort of just on the computer, uh, and then you bounce back and forth between running experiments that help you and in, help inform you how to make the model better, and then you change the model, and then you go back into the lab, and you go back and forth between the two. Um, so that's the other tool. Uh, but categories are everywhere. So I mentioned the, the four things. But this is our, our uh, schedule for the series. And cognitive and biological psychology is now. Uh, forensic psychology, uh, you can imagine people doing fingerprint, de fingerprint uh, identification and analysis, which is a categorization problem. Uh, in developmental psychology, you can understand, uh, you look and look at uh, how children learn to selectively attend to the important things and control their attention. Uh, and I, I'm teaching my, uh, my daughter, who's two and a half, how to count. And uh, one of the, the big problem is not that they don't know how to count, it's that they don't count in an orderly way. They count this one, and then they count that one, and then they count this one, and then they count that one, and then they lose track of which ones they've counted and which ones they haven't, and then they just sort of arbitrarily decide to stop, and that's the number they get. Um, so developmentally, being able to, to attend to the information that, that is important and control your attention is an incredibly important uh, skill. And finally, social psychology. Uh, stereotypes are a kind of category. They have properties. You think, the, you know, you make inferences based on what, uh, what you think about st various stereotypes. And understanding how people learn and overcome stereotypes is very much a part of uh, understanding how people categorize. So the field that uh, I am I'm in, even though I do cognitive stuff, is very much a core cognitive process that's related to all areas of psychology. Um, so I'd like now to spend a couple minutes showing you how important attention uh, really is to your daily experience. Now I could uh, trot out a whole million studies that sort of suggest this with lots of you know, academic uh, jargon and data graphs and you would probably all fall asleep, uh, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, instead, I'm going to prove to you that attention is really important. And attention is the gateway to your experience. So uh, 
First, we're going to do a task, and we're going to see how good your attention is. In this task, there's these people, and they're throwing a basketball around. And your job is to count how many passes the team with the white shirts does. So they pass it once, you count one, they pass it again, you count two, and just keep track. Uh, and it gets to a, a, a large number. And the SFU is thinking about uh, having this as part of their uh, uh, evaluation of incoming students. So you might want to you know, try your best. Um, and also, do please be quiet, because attention can get distracted by noise. So everybody be quiet. Do your best to count. Uh, and we'll see how many people get the right answer. OK, so how many people did, how many did we get? How many people said 10? 10? 12? 11? How many 11s? 12? I saw six. <laughs> yeah, the attention researcher sees six. You always, you always study what your deficit is, right? Uh, 13? 13. 13. 14. 14. 14 is the right answer. Congratulations. You guys have all been admitted to SFU. <laughs> Um, so here's another example. Here's another example of, of uh, the fact that it's actually really hard to detect changes in your environment. We have this idea that, that we see the whole world, like all the time, at once, coming in, right? And that's just not right. What happens is you see the bits that you're attending to, and by and large, don't see the bits that you're not attending to. This is very counterintuitive, uh, but I'm hoping that these next couple demonstrations will prove that to you. In this picture, something is going to change. What, I, what we've done, what uh, I, don't, I didn't do it, but somebody uh, put two images next to each other and just changed one thing. And there's just a little flash in between them. So what you're going to see is a flash and, and the picture. And it's going to look like the picture's not changing. The picture is changing. Something in the picture disappears and reappears and disappears and reappears over and over and over and over again. So my question, my first question is, how long do you think it would take you to find a change like this? So how many people say like, like 10 seconds to find it? So fl 10, 10 flashes back and forth. How many take you like 15 seconds? How many like 20 seconds? How many say like five or less? What are the rest of you, like a minute? <laughs> Have some self-confidence, come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here it is. It's not going to look like it's changing, but it is. Search for what's changing. When you've found what's changing, raise your hand and raise it high. You guys are a little slower than you thought you would be. <laughs> we still have less than half of the people. Good. OK. Uh, you're not in SFU anymore. We're yeah, yeah, exactly. You're, you're not in SFU anymore. Sorry. We'll, yeah. Most people have it. Look here. <laughs> Let's do another one. This one is even easier to detect. I see it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so let's do this one. Ready? Raise your hand if you get it. <laughs> and this is a big one. I mean, once you see it, you're like, hey, why didn't I see that right away? Anybody feel like they should be a little more attentive? <laughs> right? I mean, you feel like you're connected to the world in a really strong way, and yet you're connected only to the extent that you're attending to the right thing. Uh, anybody not find it yet? Should I, should I point it out? I mean, it's right there in the screen. I mean, it's big. It's big. 
Okay, this one doesn't flash. You might think, aha, well, it's some kind of flashing thing, right? He's zapping my brain so that I can't see properly. Well, this one changes very slowly. Okay, so see if you can see this one. Oh. <laughs> Good. What, the rest of you? Are we getting lazy with the hands? Yeah. How, did anybody miss it? Yeah. Okay, let me, let me do it. Let me just do it. Oh, that probably did. Did you see that? Let's, let's do it again. Let's do it again. I don't see it. Yeah, the attention researcher. Uh, so that's another example, right? Uh, and now I'm sure you're thinking, okay, but things don't just, you know, come in slowly like that. That's another sort of video trick. Well, some uh, researchers, Dan Simon and Dan Levin, uh, did studies in the real world where they changed a person that was in the midst of a conversation. So they do this incredibly cleverly with this door, and I've got, this, I've got the video, so just watch the video. But know that half the people in this study did not detect a change. So guy stops, asks for directions, and now guys switch, totally different guy. Wow. Half the people in this study did not detect this change. Like in the world, like a person you're actually talking to, right? I mean, this is not a video trick. This is. <laughs> Nothing. And I've got another one. No detect, just la da 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 da. So attention is really important in how we perceive and engage with the world. And it happens without your conscious awareness. And lots of things are happening in the environment that you might not be aware of. Um, and I know, that, I know you're, you may be thinking, OK, so some people might miss that. But I saw a lot of those. And it wasn't me who missed something. Um, but it might have been you who missed something. Because I played a little bit of a trick on you. You remember this? How many people, without saying anything, how many people saw something weird about this video while they were watching? So a few of you. Uh, I'm gonna, now I want you to watch it again. Forget about the numbers, right? We're, don't count, just watch. See if there's something you might have missed the first time through. It's a gorilla. You missed a gorilla. It even stops and does a little dance, and you missed it. So I think that these demonstrations show a lot more uh, effectively how important our attention is and how we take for granted all of those cognitive processes that make up our real first-person subjective experience of the world. Uh, so on that note, uh, I will end and hand it over to John, having probably gone 10 minutes over. No, no. Oh, good. Right on the mic. Right. All right. Very good. Great. 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 While we're transitioning, I'm sure Mark will get a few questions. Oh, right. i got to hold this for questions. Any questions? Put up your hand if you do, and we'll get a microphone over to you as well. Oh, somebody ask a question. Please. There you go. Well, uh, I'll ask you a question that's partly rooted in my own field, which is art history. Yeah. Um, when you track the movements of, uh, of a attention through the eye, yeah. um, what happens if you switch to a picture that's very carefully composed? I mean, most artists, or traditionally artists, thought that they could control your attention and your ideas by controlling the composition of something. Right, uh, and and uh, I haven't. I don't know the liter that literature. Uh, I would be astounded if somebody hasn't done something on it, yeah. uh, and it would be very easy to do. Because what strikes me about the image that you showed was it was actually very carefully composed. I could understand. I, I mean, I felt like I could see why 
um, a trained eye would look at two things in particular. Right, right. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah, uh, so I mean, that's a really interesting stuff, and that's a nice application for sort of eye tracking things. Eye tracking as a technology is used in, in all kinds of things, web usability studies, software design, yeah. uh, lots of different things. So I can bring my Im uh, yeah. art historical yeah. images to your lab? And yeah, bring the I'm images over, and we'll, and we'll do a study. I think that'd be great. OK. This is a little more general question uh, because you didn't cover it in your uh, talk, but how much is known about the neurobiology of cognition and how our experience, developmental experience, influences how two different people might uh, interpret other data? Um, that is an excellent question, and I think I am going to uh, hand that one off to our neurobiology experts. These guys are the brain guys, uh, much more of the brain guys than I am. So uh, just repeat the question in, in 30 minutes. I'm sure I'll get a good answer. Any other, any other question? Oh, I, I, and then we'll run back and get you. Or, can the type of research that you're doing um, be applied? Sorry. Can the type of research that you're doing be applied to uh, teaching tasks uh, for attention for attention deficit type individuals? Uh, yeah, potentially. I mean, uh, I do basic research, and as such, I'm interested in sort of the basic underlying cognitive components. But that filters out to how we teach, right? I mean, how our brain processes information, information, and how our attention moves around, and how we can control that uh, is uh, would be fundamental to that sort of stuff. Most of the studies that I do are learning studies. So we make up sort of fictitious microorganisms and things like that, and then uh, track how, uh, how things change with an eye toward making people you know, more effective learners by uh, potentially training, you know, training their attentional capacities. And people are, are bad in lots of interesting ways. Like sometimes if you add a new component to a stimulus, a new uh, feature to a picture, they, people will not incorporate that into what they, they're doing. So they sort of have a, a, you know, a, a resistance to learning new things or changing their ideas, uh, even on a really small scale like this. Uh, and so one of the things we found is that if you train somebody on something that's got sort of two important features and then you add one, it's actually worse than if you had never trained them on the two at all. So in some cases, presenting simple sort of stuff and then building your way up might actually be uh, doing more harm than good. I mean, not, not again, not generally speaking, but uh, there are at least some cases where, where that's the case. And so that's a, a clear, you know, clear learning uh, implications for studies like that. Yeah. Last question. I, th I think you answered my question. Mine was how do you improve your, um, your attention? Yeah, well. Uh, uh, so practice is a really good thing to do. Uh, practice, practice, practice. Uh, uh, when you practice a task, uh, a selective attention task, uh, they become what's called automatized. So you don't have to consciously do it anymore. It just sort of happens and you can think about other things and pay attention, sort of, uh, you know, spend your cognitive resources on other kinds of things. And so, uh, so that's one, c one sort of key component. But you want to make sure that people are attending to the right things. So for instance, uh, in, the, in the luggage scanning thing, people have done research on training luggage luggage scanners, and what they are good at is identifying specific pictures. Right? So they know that that picture has a knife and they respond in a certain way. And they get very good at that, and that's exactly the wrong thing that you want them to be learning. What you want them to be learning is how to find the knife. But they learn which picture has a knife. So if you give them a new set of pictures, they're back at chance performance. Right? And that's obviously got, got you know, scary real world implications to that kind of thing. So you have to get the task right or people get trained on something you didn't want them to learn. People are very good learners and they'll succeed in lots of different ways and so you have to be very careful about uh, how you construct tasks like that. Thanks Mark. Yeah. Thank so. you very much.